Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In uh, tonight's video, I wanted to address uh, a very important question in um, the global political economy, which is, um, is economic growth unqualifiedly good? Now, you know, certainly if you come from a very poor country, the first inclination would be, yes, it is unqualifiedly unqual good, um, and, you know, if somebody were to pose it to me in purely in the abstract, I would uh, certainly say that the potential to have, you know, higher levels of income and, you know, the higher levels of uh, welfare gains and, you know, health gains, etc., uh, are, you know, important and positive enough that we should support uh, economic growth. Uh, also, given the fact that we have, you know, very poor growth situation um, in the Western developed world, um, you know, which leads to, um, you know, income and wealth inequality and, you know, social struggles. Um, you know, part of that has to do with the lack of growth. But uh, my objective in today's video actually is to convince you uh, that um, that no growth is not uh, unqualifiedly good. And I'll give you three reasons uh, for that. Uh, firstly, uh, that brings me back to the point of inequality. Um, it is certainly true that, you know, if you have, uh, you know, very low growth, that you could have an increase in inequality. But in our case, in the, you know, Western developed world, uh, but also in other parts of the world, we see rising inequality regardless. Um, and, you know, and, you know, part of that is, you know, techno uh, technological boom that we are facing, which um, t generally tends to concentrate the wealth into the hands of a few uh, individuals who own uh, the technology. So if you think of, you know, Apple or Google, as instances. Um, we have globalization, which means that, you know, you have uh, a global labor market, um, which had doubled with the fall of communism, and particularly uh, China and India as the biggest populations in the world, uh, also joining the global labor force. Uh, that increases the choices for uh, companies to hire uh, as they see fit. Uh, and um, to reduce the labor demand for uh, workers in the capitalist, uh, in the core capitalist countries in the West. Um, inequality also increases with, you know, lax corporate governance structures. Um, and, you know, one example of that are uh, patent laws, um, which, you know, favor, you know, quasi-monopoly status uh, of, for instance, you know, pharmaceutical uh, drugs, um, you know, also, you know, the uh, bad accounting strategies, uh, Enron would be just one example of that, uh, and also uh, corporate governance that particularly favors, you know, the shareholder uh, agenda, shareholder value maximization agenda, rather than the stakeholders and the communities and the workers in particular. Uh, and finally, we also have lower taxes on the rich, so it's the entire regulatory environment which is then favoring um, the very wealthy individuals. Um, and, you know, all of these things, um, you know, we also have, you know, weak uh, you know, labor market, we have, you know, uh, ele elevated levels of unemployment, and we also have weak labor organizations, weak labor unions that uh, protect interests of the workers such that uh, the bosses can get away with higher earnings. Um, so that uh, implies that, um, you, know, you know, all of this economic growth that we are, whatever we face, um, is uh, going to the very wealthy. Um, uh, so that means, you know, regardless of whether we have growth or not, um, it contributes to rising uh, inequality. Uh, second element I wanted to discuss 
is the spiritual factor and that is to say that even you know if you had growth um, which um, many people can benefit from uh, it doesn't uh, say anything about the spiritual level of happiness that we might have um, you know, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I draw the terminology from you know, Wilkinson and Pickett's uh, research and the spirit level, where they basically talked about inequality and the effects uh, that it has on uh, violence, crime, mental health, education, obesity, and many other elements, uh, all of those uh, factors becoming worse uh, as inequality goes up. Um, but even aside from that, you know, even if income is growing, uh, does growth by itself make happy? And I would make the case that um, it doesn't necessarily. Um, you know, there's you know, evidence whereby, you know, if you have rising uh, incomes, uh, you know, GDP per capita, um, you have, you know, rising levels of happiness, which have to do with fulfilling uh, basic needs, for instance, um, you know, sending your kids to the doctor when you weren't able to afford to, eating meat in a diet, um, you know, because you can afford to, and, and things like that. Uh, but beyond a certain point, um, you know, if you reach like a middle income status, then usually uh, happiness levels uh, don't have any marginal increase with rising income. Um, what it suggests to us is that you know homo economicus um, the idea that you know we humans are only driven uh, by money um, is not true I mean it's not the case I mean for most of us you know we have not um, you do not sit in uh, top corporate boards or you know thinking about you know making money all day long uh, our primary concern would be you know I guess, you know, quality time, so to speak, with, you know, friends and family um, and, you know, doing something useful for the society. Um, I, for instance, I mean, I enjoy, you know, reading social science books uh, and, and, and writing. Um, and uh, that certainly is not directly related to any kind of monetary um, in incentive. Uh, so if we really think hard about, you know, what motivates us as humans, uh, it certainly is uh, not necessarily uh, related to uh, money growth. Uh, you know, money in a sense, I mean, is essential for covering um, the, the, the needs that we have, uh, means to an end if we want, for instance, to go traveling um, or, you know, do some interesting things or you know buy a nice car or something like that but um, you know keeping up with the Jonas's you know trying to increase your levels of income commensurate with uh, what your neighbor earns um, usually leads to burnout and to uh, unhappiness and that's uh, the spiritual factor uh, that uh, is uh, harmed by you know the uh, economic uh, growth agenda. And thirdly, and I think this is the most important point, which is the relationship with the environment. Um, and um, we have to think about what is the implication of economic growth on the environment. Um, and uh, the most important part of that is climate change. Um, you know, we have, there's a clear link between, you know, human uh, inputs uh, that is to say, our industrial lifestyle, um, you know, including you know food habits, you know, eating a lot of meat, um, or you know driving cars, um, or you know, or just our consumerism, you know, like buying a gadget, you know, throwing it away, buying a new one. Uh, all of that contributes to the cycle of growth, obviously, um, but it's. Um, unlikely to be uh, environmentally um, sustainable. Um, if you look, for instance, at the Paris Agreement, uh, which was, uh, went into effect uh, last month, uh, and the world leaders have the very ambitious target uh, because they can no longer ignore the problem 
uh, that um, well they they wanted to uh, set the maximum increase of temperatures to two degrees uh, Celsius, um, but uh, interestingly, um, we already face um, warming of uh, 1.2 degrees, uh, so we only have you know less than half uh, of the allowed uh, temperature to go up. Um, so the the pressure that is um, put on the policymakers and 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 you know has to be put on uh, the the people the the rising middle class in China for instance or in other countries um, people in the in the most developed countries of course that uh, carry the most of the uh, CO two emissions um, we have a long way to go uh, and we really, really don't know. What to do, given that also, you know, we have the economic growth imperative. Um, and also, it is very difficult to make the case to less developed countries uh, that they must not pollute uh, the world when the rich developed countries have done so over the last 200 years. Um, but for instance, um, you know, the most um, fast rising economy, which is China, um, is itself facing an enormous amount of air pollution, as we have seen the last uh, month or so. Uh, there's no wind that goes in the north northern region in China, and so you have the uh, pollution that is stuck uh, at the ground level, and uh, you know people are facing you know various difficulties. For instance, like just looking. You know, cup one even one block ahead is is, is difficult in, in traffic. Um, also, you have um, people with breathing problems and heart attacks, etc. Uh, all of these um, uh, environmental problems, which uh, the people in China are facing, uh, also is a direct result of the growth agenda, and also the simply the fact that they are. Still using coal plants, which are you know the coal being abundantly available in China, but of course you can see what the problem is um, with the um, unrestricted uh, growth agenda. So I may say as a point of conclusion that um, while you know I guess economic growth in a general sense um, is good. Um, in an, it is certainly not unqualifiedly good uh, because of the negative elements of you know uh, inequality, the spiritual unhappiness, and the environmental uh, consequences of growth. Um, you know the conclusion statement, therefore, is to say that you know it certainly you know sucks to have a low growth economy, as we can see in today's Western world, where you know you've banking crisis, you have um, you know, economic crisis, you have unemployment and things like that, all stemming from um, insufficient uh, amount of growth. But um, I hope that I have now convinced you that uh, in today's world it sucks even more uh, to still depend on economic growth uh, in our world. Thank you.